Sir Peter Blake. Thank you very much indeed. It's, uh, it's a huge pleasure and a huge privilege for me to be given the opportunity to uh, meet for the first time uh, Sir Peter Blake, who's, as I'd almost say, as long as I've been conscious, I've been conscious of him um, and, and his work and its impact in so many different ways, which I hope we can talk a little bit about over the next, over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, we also want to talk about his current project, that lucky old son, with uh, Brian Wilson, which is also extremely fascinating and ties into some of the strands of the things we may talk about too. I must say, walking down through the audience, I don't think I've ever seen so many iPhones congregated in, in one room, so hopefully there's plenty of tweeting going on too to tell the world at large about this, this fantastic event. Um, Sir Peter, can I ask you first of all, I was, uh, as journalists do, I was looking around the internet thinking about what it was I might ask you about, and I came across an interview you did with the, the journalist Lynn Barber um, a couple of years ago, about, yeah. about three years or so ago. And uh, there's a film in cinemas at the moment, I don't know if you've seen it, called An Education, yeah. which is based on her early years growing up and an experience she had. It's set in very early 60s, essentially 1950s England. And the society it portrays is quite rigid, quite unimaginative, quite sterile. And, and she as a young girl is trying to break out of that. Yeah. And, it caused me to wonder, um, along with the interesting points you had to make about your work, when, when you were starting, when you were starting to, to think about being an artist and when you were starting on your first steps there, the backdrop of the society in which you started forming your vision, if you like, was a very unpropitious one for the kind of vision you were forming. Um, you were bringing colour to what, to my perception, seemed like a very drab world. Would that be fair? Um, yeah, th th that's very fair. I, mean, I, I think probably I should explain um, uh, that that was the most fantastic lecture, that, that last one. So pure and, and so, so kind of, um, it was just pure. And I, so in a way, I think I ought to explain myself as, as being um, a kind of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rogue designer and I'm a rogue painter in, in a curious way. And the background to that is that I went, I, um, right at the end of the Second World War, I suddenly had the opportunity to go to art school at the age of 14. So I did a um, junior art department at Gravesend School of Art. Then the old intermediate examination, which was a, had gone back to Victorian times, so I did typography and things like that, a whole list of things. And then I um, wanted to be a painter, but um, the staff at Gravesend suggested that um, I, I'd never make it as a painter and people didn't make a living as, as painters, so I should do the commercial art course. So I did one year of what was then called the National Diploma, um, and then I tried for the Royal College as an illustrator and sent one painting and I was accepted into the painting school. So this in a way kind of explains my background a bit. So I then had to do national service, and it, so I started at the Royal College um, never really having been a painting student but being a kind of unformed, um, you, uh, only having done one year of a two-year graphic design course. So, so this, in a way, explains um, why I kind of, uh, what I am now, that you know, I, I, can, I can dip into the graphic design world, but as I say, as a rogue, you know, I, I can make graphic design, but I don't quite understand it. And I'm a painter with a background of being a graphic designer. So that kind of accounts for, for what I do in a way. So uh, you, before we come in, you used the word mongrel, but yeah. you used it quite proudly. It's a, it's a good word. Yeah, no, yes. Well, I think, I think rogue in one sense, in the sense of a rogue elephant crashing mm. about, <laughs> but mongrel as well, yeah. I mean, mongrel's a better word. Really. When you say you were discouraged from embarking on a career as a painter, is that because painting was seen as, what, a gentleman's pursuit or, uh, or the you know, that it wasn't a paying career, or is there an element well, of class within that about well, this what somebody can aspire to do? I mean, this goes back to your question, which I didn't really answer. I mean, this, was all, this all happened in 19, um, 1946. I first went to the junior art department. So this was in the late 40s. I mean, just after the war, um, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to have become an artist before the war, because, as you suggest, it was a kind of gentleman's activity, really. So suddenly there was that whole opportunity um, at, at the end of the Second World War with grants and, and, and things like that, that um, you painted, you, people could go to art school, 
young actors were coming through, young photographers. So, uh, so a, whole, um, a whole kind of ethos was, was brought into the art world that wasn't there before. And, and um, in, in a way, that also explains what I went on to become. I noticed in the, in, in the listings, um, it, 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 for each person, it says craft. And my craft, um, it says pop artist. But, uh, but I mean, it could say illustrator, it could say many things. It could, it could say painter, it could say designer. But um, you, um, I, I think that that's what happened. What, is the, what does the description pop artist say to you? Well, it's a, diffic it's a difficult question. It, it also um, slightly misinforms and says that I, I was in, the, in the, that big um, Young Contemporaries exhibition in 1961 with Hockney and, and people like oh. that. Uh, the pop-up movement, I, I was a little before that at the Royal College. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I was pretty much a pop artist, but it was something that came and went. You know, in a way, it was a very short movement, which left ramifications. I mean, things from it go on, but it, was, it, was, it really only went from the mid-50s to the early 60s. And would it have been strongly influencing you at the time, the work coming out of America from Jasper Johns? And well, um, certainly Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg would, would mm. have been people I was interested in. Um, and, and, and I think you, the brief history of pop art, which I've talked about before, they, they were happening in America. The IC, at the ICA, you had the independent group with, with Richard Hamilton and Palazzi, who were intellectuals discussing popular culture. And then at the Royal College, um, you, you was myself, um, having come from a background of popular culture, you, who having been a youth, went to jazz clubs and wrestling and fun fairs and stuff like that. And I started to paint kind of autobiographical works about the world I'd come from. So that was my, my, my element of pop art. But for Rosenberg and Johns, what they were doing in terms of taking imagery from comic strips and, and, and popular culture had a certain meaning within American culture. Yeah. Would it be true to say at all that for, for you and other artists working in Britain, there might have been added layers or a slightly different perspective because one of the things you were doing was you, you were relating to this very American material a lot of the time because that's what the yeah. keynotes of, of popular culture were at the time. I think, I think we were approaching it differently. I, I mean, for instance, I, I have a theory that, um, that, that Lichtenstein didn't actually like comic books, whereas I loved comic books. You know, mm -hmm. I read them and, 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 and you was kind of, the work I made was an affection for comic books, whereas, whereas in, his work was always very hard. And, and it, I, you know, I always had the feeling that he just didn't like them. And mm -hmm. in a way that illustrates the difference between American pop art and British pop art. And, and I think British pop art um, was celebratory and American pop art was, was, in the main was cynical, I think. And I've actually seen a couple of people who made this comparison who suggested that Warhol, who of course com, com, comes later, but that a lot of, of the other American pop artists saw themselves to some extent as commenting on the banality of popular culture and the vacuousness of society, or that they were using this imagery in some, in some ways like that. Yeah. Whereas you would, have, you would not have been coming from that direction, really. No, as I say, I, I was celebrating, celebrating the things I painted. But when I, 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 in a way, I used cynical almost as a compliment. I mean, the, the ultimate was, was Andy Warhol, who, who was incredibly cynical and, and looking back was a genius. I mean, what he did, the way he produced things. And um, you know, I, I said when he died, um, there's no need for any of this to stop, you know, because there's a, there's a bank of imagery there's a team of people who can still run them off, mm -hmm. and there are a couple of people who can still sign them. And that's, a, I mean, it's a wonderful kind of... Um, and that's, that's what happened, I think, to I'm some sure extent, it did, in some ways, um, uh, um, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of, of the effect, then, that Warhol would have had the, the, the YBAs, the young British artists of, of, of the last 10 or 15 years, clearly hugely influenced by that? Whatever about the brilliance of his original idea and its execution. What do you think of the way it's rippled through culture and popular culture in the years since? Um, well, it was, such a, it was such an extraordinary approach, wasn't it? And, and, and I think the YBA certainly must have picked up on, on, on people like um, Andy Warhol and Jeff Koons and the way they produced themselves. Um, perhaps Damien's a good, uh, Damien Hurst is a good example of that, you know, who, uh, who, who again is a genius and, and in a way has marketed himself and, and the work he makes. Uh, um, I know we, we don't have too much time, but my, my, one of my theories about 
Damien, is that he, he brought to a conclusion the two main branches of abstract painting. He brought, you know, with, with, with the spot paintings, he, 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 he ticked off the whole of colour field painting. You know, so, so people like um, you know, Ellsworth Kelly and Nolan, who, who I admire, you know, I'm not, not putting them down, but in a way Damien's, um, you know, with the spot paintings, you, you know exactly what size they'll be, you know they touch the edge of the picture, there's a colour range, you could order it over the phone. Um, and this isn't putting them down, I mean this is bringing the whole thing to a kind of wonderful conclusion. And with the spin paintings, in a way he brought the whole of abstract expressionism to, to, a, to a conclusion. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the best pictures about throwing paint onto a canvas there could be, you know. So, so um, he's, he's a genius in the same sort of way that Andy was. You, were, you mentioned this, that famous ICA show in, in 1961, and then I think it was in 1962, Ken Russell made a famous <coughs> TV documentary about British pop art in which, in which you figured. I well, well a, a, a bunch of, of nice things happened in 61. And one, the one that didn't happen was that I wasn't in that young contemporary show, mm. which was brilliant. It had, it had Kitai, Hockney, Patrick Caulfield, Alan Jones, Derek Boucher. I mean, the hard, you know, that kind of core of, of, of British pop art. I wasn't in that, but, um, but w what did happen was that the Sunday Times came out, and the, the first colour supplement came out, and there was an article on my work. Um, the Ken Russell film was actually made in 61. It was shown in 62. Mm. Um, a film called, um, I suggested the title as, as a joke to Ken, which was um, Pop Goes the Easel. Um, and he thought, you know, so he, he used it as the title of the film. And that was a film about myself, Pauline Boaty, Derek Boucher, and Peter Phillips. Um, and it was, it was her, his first full-length film, The Monitor, and the first kind of um, film about pop art, I think. And the other thing that happened was that in Liverpool, I won the Junior Prize in the John Moores. So, so really everything started for me from in 61. And it, it's... It seems that at this remove to me that as that was going on, British society started changing very quickly as yeah. well. So there's a sort of a mirror reflecting image between yeah, your own personal fortunes uh, Im improving and gaining recognition and also, I suppose, for want of a better word, what one might call the swinging 60s with, yeah. in, in all its ramifications starting yeah. to kick in, which was great for you. I it was a great time, time. yeah. I, mean, I was with the Robert Fraser Gallery and um, we're going to have to talk about Sergeant Pepper, I'm sure, aren't we? Just going to have to come up. But, I suppose um, so. But, but, um, <laughs> but I was friends with the Beatles you, in, in the very early 60s and knew the Stones and the Who. You, I mean, I knew all the musicians for some reason. You, I met the, most of them. Um, and could, it was could, exciting. Would you mind, could you give me an idea of, of that? I mean, how, in what context would, would all these... I mean, you know, was it like an Austin Powers movie? Were you all hanging around in Carnaby Street, you know? Well, uh, <laughs> a little bit. I mean, the, the, the big... The, 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 and what I missed was I, I never did any drugs, so I was always surrounded by people stoned out of their minds. Um, I mean, when they were recording Sergeant Pepper, the only, um, George Martin and I were the only people who kind of knew what was going on. You know, cause, cause <laughs> everyone else was, was on their LSD trips and all over the place. And so so it, was, it was an exciting time all around, as, you know, as I've said, with the young, young photographers coming through, you know, Donna, um, Terence Donovan and Bailey and Duffy and, and, and young actors coming through and um, young act, you, people like Julie Christie and, and the, you, you, Twiggy and Justin. It, it, I mean, it was an amazing time. And would, you, <clears throat> would you have felt that you were doing in a different medium the same type of thing that, say, the Beatles, for example, were, were doing in terms of pulling new influences into British culture and reshaping British culture in exciting ways for a new generation, I suppose? I think so, yeah, and, and, and I, uh, you, my, my kind of branch of, of, of pop art was very much about um, being um, populist as well, you know, it was, it, you know, what, what I tried to do was make an art that um, you know, the, the, the 15-year-old girl who bought Boyfriend magazine and loved Elvis would like my work on exactly the same level, and in fact, it didn't work because the, the mechanics couldn't work. I mean, the language didn't work. The, you know, the coloured stripes and targets and hearts and stars and things like that didn't relate directly to, to, um, to that generation. And, and what you got um, in Boyfriend magazine, you, you'd get you know, a, a, a painting of Elvis, 
looking a bit like a Duncan Grant, or very painterly, and, and, and on, a, um, on a paper that, that was printed to look like canvas. So, so that carried on in, in that kind of very British 30s painting tradition. Mm. And what I was trying to do didn't, it didn't work in that sense, but did lead to, but, to something But it might have like led into completely different types of things, yeah. like ending up with a target on the back of a mod who's sitting on a uh, on his parka, on a scooter, going to Brighton or something Exactly, like yeah. Well, um, um, I think that particular, you, you, what happened was that the, the Who's manager, um, right at the beginning, you, after they were the high numbers, decided they would be called the Pop Art Group and, and apparently went through various catalogues and invented a look. You, he took the target from my first real target. He took the, the, um, the black and white diagonal belt from a a piece that Cliff Westerman, the American sculptor, had made. He, he, he made a Union Jack jacket based on things I'd done and, and, and the badges, your know, badges on the, on the jacket. So, so it, it, you were already getting this kind of two-way thing going on. Mm. And equally then, the, the two-way thing develops in, in new ways as, as you become successful. And in a way, this, this again, can't get away from the Beatles here, no. mirrors, mirrors the Beatles to some extent. You've been fascinated by Americana. You've been using American images, among others, not exclusively American, but a lot, a lot, of, a lot of American popular culture images. And you pay your first trip to America. And I always wonder that disjunction. I remember it myself the very first time I went to the United States. The interesting relationship between the America of your imagination and the America of actually being there. And they're almost the same, but slightly different. Well, my first trip to America was 63. And I was commissioned by the Sunday Times had this idea that they would um, take a group of artists and give you a set amount of money. I think it was 300 pounds. And the idea was that you, you chose where you would like to go. You traveled to that place and you did a portfolio of, of work. And um, Hockney was the first to be offered it. And he, he went, oddly enough, he didn't go to Hollywood. He, he went to, to Egypt and did those wonderful kind of 1960-61 beautiful Egyptian drawings. Um, I, I just... Um, just married an American girl from Hollywood um, in that year, and I, I, I'd never visited um, America, so it was a good chance to go there. And we we arrived, um, we um, went went by boat and, and travelled across country on the Super Chief by train, and we were met at um, Los Angeles train station by my first wife's father, who was in the film industry, um, who who then lent us a Corvette Stingray. A big, a gold Perfect. Corvette Stingray, which we then drove for the time, time we were there. And at one point, I mean, and this leads into Lucky Old Son, at one point on Venice Beach, on the radio, the Beach Boys were playing. I mean, almost perfection. Um, so your first experience of America was driving through so LA it, so, in a Corvette so Stingray with the Beach Boys on the radio. That yeah. could hardly be more so, perfect. So it, it was my dream. It was my dream, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and, and so, um, out of that came my love of Brian Wilson, um, who is still my, my ultimate hero. And, and um, I mean, to explain Lucky Old Son, what happened was I was doing an interview similar to this and, and moaning about Sergeant Pepper and the fact that I was paid so little and it still was a kind of bugbear at that point. And I, I think I, I said um, I would much rather have done Pet Sounds for the Beach Boys than Sergeant Pepper for the Beatles. And this got back somehow to Brian Wilson and so they contacted me and said, did you really mean that? You, because we're about to, to bring out a, a new record. Um, would you do the cover for that? Well, they, um, they were about to bring out Smile, you know, which was the unfinished mm. kind of masterpiece. So I assumed they were asking me to do that. Um, and in fact, it was a, um, they, they'd had designs done for that in the 60s, so they felt an obligation to use the, those original designs. And they were asking me to do an album cover called um, Getting In Over My Head, which was um, um, all Brian Wilson songs. And so I did that cover. And then we talked about doing something else. And um, he, um, we talked about my um, take, he, he was going to write out all the words to um, all the Pet Sound songs, and I would illustrate them. And it moved on from that to, to the newer record of, called Lucky Old Son. So what they are, I think they've been coming up behind us as mm. we talk. Um, they're, they're images taking, um, taking a line from each song and, and illustrating that line. So I think they've been, um, I mean that one for instance is show me that river, take me across. So, and and they're, they're done on the computer 
Um, I can't work a computer, but um, you, I go to Coriander Studios and they do it. So it, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of material, um, some of which came from Brian himself, some <coughs> came from Brian Roiland, who, who started off Genesis Publications and sadly died some years ago, but um, he'd taken a lot of photographs in California. So, so it's a combination of his work and, and found things that <coughs> Brian sent me and, and then put together on the computer. And they are, not surprisingly, given, uh, given Brian Wilson and his music, are very Californian. They're ar ar quite a lot of them are, are archetypes of, of Southern California. Yes, well, they're, they're quite different from, from other work I'm doing at the moment, but they, um, I mean, they, they hopefully they celebrate um, exactly what he's celebrating. I mean, the, the album is very much in the, in the kind of um, mood of, of Gershwin or Aaron Copeland or something like that. And it, it's a hymn to California. So what I've tried to do is, is add, add to that and, and add to it visually. Did you meet Brian Wilson at that, that time in 1963, 1964? No. When did you meet him first? Oh, yes, I did. I met him in 64 because I, <coughs> I, did, a, I did a print. Um, um, I did a, a silkscreen print of the Beach Boys and what happened was the ICA published a portfolio of prints and they are 20 artists each made an image and Chris Prater um, who went on to become Kelpra Press um, who at that point was a commercial silkscreen printer he printed the portfolio and, and, and my images of the Beach Boys um, coincided when I signed them coincided with the fact that they were playing in London that day. So, so we, we ran off, um, we had five extras, so I signed them to each of the Beach Boys, took them to the theatre <coughs> where, where, where they were playing, and um, Brian, well, um, suddenly Mike Love came out, and, and I think Brian came out, and if it wasn't, if it was one of the other Wilson boys, I, I always say it was Brian. I think it was, so I think that's when we first met. So your, um, your, your first encounter with their music, as you said, would have been in, in 63, yeah. um, when they were the pure, pure surf, pure, surf, yeah. surf pop, yeah. Um, yeah. essentially. And yeah. then the, the, this genius of Brian Wilson comes more and more to the fore, this kind of symphonic, uh, incredibly original creativity. Uh, I love that, by the way, the idea that you might have um, designed covers for both Sgt. Peppers and Pet Sounds, would you know? Cool, uh, it really would have yeah. been very, very cool <laughs> indeed. Uh, and actually, Probably the only bad thing about Pet Sounds is the cover. No, 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 it's no, not think good, it. is it? Really? <laughs> but I think what was interesting at the time, um, and, and what, you, what you're bringing up a little bit, is this competition between mm. um, particularly Brian, I think not the other Beach Boys so much, but particularly Brian and, and the Beatles, you know, that, that Pet Sounds came out and then um, and, and influenced the Beatles to make Sergeant Pepper. And then he was putting Smile together. And I think the story is you kind of panicked and thought, I can't compete with this, you know, with the music, and, and went into a kind of, um, in, went inward and, and hid away for years, and then slowly came back writing these great kind of anthems to America, these great, mm. great, great, great songs. Mm. Ab absolutely. And Working uh, with Van Dyke Parks. Well, I was just going to mention Van yeah. Dyke Parks yeah. and that, that fantastic collaboration. Yeah. But when would you have actually got to, when did you actually get to know Brian Wilson? Um, in London, when he came to do the Pet Sounds, um, concert at the Festival Hall mm. and um, his then manager um, called and said um, would we have dinner with, with Melinda, Brian's wife um, uh, uh, and so we, we um, were going to go to the Wolseley and just before we left there was a phone call from her and she said Melinda's not very well but would you mind if Brian came? So we met at about um, five o'clock you know, to eat very early I mean there was still Lunch, lunch people eating who, who were slowly going off. So eventually we were almost by ourselves, the four of us, um, sitting having dinner. And Brian um, sat almost motionless. And um, when I ordered a starter, Brian said, I'll have, I'll have the same as you. And then he ordered um, a, a steak which came. Um, and it, it, it was a, they, there was a list of steaks that he could order. And he said, I, I would like a big steak. Um, and so they brought a rather fat steak and, and, and he ate that. And then at a certain point, he, he clearly just thought, I want to go now, and just got up and, and went across and stood by the door and just waited. So mm. it, it was a, a, a weird, wonderful experience. I mean, at, at that stage, he's, he's become much better now. I mean, but at that stage, he was still 
very awkward. Um, but it was a fantastic, I mean, to, to have actually, um, I mean, it's almost like a line from a song, isn't it? I had dinner with Brian Wilson. It's like a, a song from Lucky Old Son. Because he is, he is still very fragile, as I know. I've some friends who have interviewed him over the yeah. years, and it can be quite difficult for him and for the person who's, who, who's yeah. talking to him, can't it? Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th th there's an element of you clearly of damage there from whatever. I, I, I suppose, LSD, I, I'm, you, one meets people occasionally who, who, who've done that, that one trip too far who are, are kind of fine, but there's an oddness, isn't there? Mm. And, and mm. I think it's that, probably. Mm. And how close would your collaboration have been on this project? Um, we didn't. Um, it, it, the the songs were, were written, and, and I I um I had all the lyrics, and I then worked worked to the lyrics, and then he 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 saw what I'd done, and either approved it or not. In fact, he approved he approved them all. Um, mm. So it wasn't. It, it, we didn't work together in that sense. I mean, he'd already done his work. Would be more. Then, would it be fair to describe it more as an interpretation than in a collaboration yeah. than on your? Yeah. On, I mean, on, what, on your what they are a visual interpretation. Of, of an element of each song, which is quite difficult. I mean, that's a good line. You, an owl hoots its last goodbye to a co coyote on patrol. Well, I've just taken it incredibly literally. And so the, earlier in the song, it talks about dawn coming up and the, you, you, the, the highway, the first cars coming onto the highway in the morning, and, and then that line. So, so it's just taken very literally and, and interpreted in a very literal way. You mentioned David Hockney earlier. He's somebody you know, who, for, for a long period, was fascinated with the iconography of Los Angeles as yeah. well, wasn't he? But I suppose in quite a different way. Yeah, well, different in that he, he, liked, he liked the boys in, in, in LA, and I didn't particularly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, very, they're very I nice boys, them. apparently. Like, but. I, didn't, I didn't go there to find beautiful boys. You know, so. yeah. um, but I think once, once there, I mean, we probably were looking at the same kinds of things. You know. mm. Mm. There is something about the light as well, isn't there? Yeah, and that, that, initial, um, that initial set of drawings for the Sunday Times, I mean, it, um, I did things like I went, I went to the Pet Cemetery up in Tarzana and, and did some drawings, and did drawings of Mabel Stark, who was at that time an 80-year-old lion tamer, which were done from, from postcards. And I draw, drew the big donut drive in, sitting in the car, sitting in the Corvette outside it, drawing the big donut. So, um, I mean, it, it, my imagery coincided pretty much with David's imagery later on. Mm. But I've always thought of you um, as a sort of a, uh, an omnivorous collector of iconography. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've read interviews with you in your studio, which some people have said is more like a, a gallery or a museum than a studio uh, in, in terms of what's to, what's to be found in there. Are you a sort of a, a collector, whether it be of physical objects or of or of images which, which appeal to you? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a collector and it started um, very specifically, to go back to that earlier story about going to Graves in School of Art, mm. that you, at the age of 14, um, you suddenly I was at art school, it was, it, it was the end of the war, um, I, I'd become a 14-year-old art student and there was a, a wonderful junk shop in Gravesend um, where, where I went one day and bought a painting of the Queen Mary um, a ma papier mache tray, a kind, which was kind of Victoriana, and a whole a whole edition of Dickens, which was leather bound. So, so I bought a kind of library that day. I bought my the beginnings of my library, and that was the beginnings of the collection. And it's just gone on, and I now, um, I mean, I won't list the things I collect, but in my studio, there's there's an area which is devoted to to pop to um to a folk art a collection. Um, and it's filled with collections of all kinds of things. So, some to work with. I mean, there, there are boxes of, of, of old driftwood which don't mean anything on their own, which will become things. Yeah. But it, it's become a museum, yeah. And within that fascination with collection, are there some types of things which appeal to you more than others? Um, well, a lot of the work is about collecting. I mean, a whole series mm. of recent work has been um, about a series of works called museums at first of the colour white and then of, of black and white objects where, where I collect material and, and make little museums of them. And, and I've been doing a lot of work recently about the alphabet. Um, so, um, so I've been collecting you know, different letters and things like that. I'm working on a book about the alphabet at the moment. Do you have a, <coughs> a particular fascination or, or, or had you at one point with um Snow White, um, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, those sort of kind of key, key Hollywood 
I suppose, pubescent um, icons, aren't I they? I think of that's what it's femininity. about. Of course, these days it's become a slightly dangerous area because it, it's veering towards paedophilia, I guess. You know, but it, it, it never clearly was about that. I mean, mm. it, it's about it's about um, young women growing up and, and going on extraordinary adventures. I mean, in Dorothy's case, to, to ours, and you know, um, it, it's no way you. Know, Getting lost and meeting the seven dwarves, and um, Alice, Alice going to Wonderland. I mean, whatever those, whatever those stories about, I was interested in them. It's it's a very primal thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. as, as as fairy stories as fairy stories tend to be, it goes back to sort of the er the earliest types of storytelling in some ways. Yeah, and, and and this concept of a journey. I mean, I've picked up on much more recently with a series of paintings called Marcel Duchamp's World Tour, mm. where where they depict. Um, a, a big silver rock and roll tour bus um, with, with on the side, uh, it says, you know, lettering says Marcel Duchamp's World Tour, and then there's a painting of, you know, of the toilet piece he made. It was, you, most of those tour buses in America, if, if they're country and western artists, you know, they have, have cowboys on the side or Indians rearing up on horses. So this, this has the, the toilet painted on the side. <laughs> and he, um, it's to thank him um, the series of paintings is to thank him for saying anything an artist makes, therefore is art, you know, whatever he exactly said. Mm. And so, I, so I've, I've sent him around the world. It still goes on a bit like the Flying Dutchman on the tour where he, he, he met he met Tracy and played her Tracy Emin and played um, chess with her and, and, and beat her in chess. Um, <laughs> he, he goes to a party with with um, a, a group of artists dressed in clothes from other art. So it's an on, he's meeting Robin Hood at the moment. He's, it's called, um, he meets Robin Hood and his merry men, and it's particularly taken with Maid Marian. And he's standing by the bus with his arm round Maid Marian. So it, it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing, it's a journey for Sounds me great. as well. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's called that, but in a way it's my journey as well. The, I mean, the Duchamp line about whatever an artist makes, is, is, is there for art, is one of the most revolutionary lines in its own way of, 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 of the 20th century. Um, I suppose it then poses the question, what is an artist? Which goes back to your, your interesting you know, oscillation between working in, in, in what is often called graphic design and then in what is often called art. I mean, do those, do those definitions have any meaning at all? Or, well, uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it was brought home to me in, 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 the, last, um, in the last lecture you, before this that, that in, in a way, they should be clearly <coughs> defined. I mean, in a way, they shouldn't tangle up. And this is why I describe myself as a mongrel, because in a way, you know, I've, I've messed up, you know. I mean, I, I have tangled it all up. But, but out of it, come, I suppose, comes a, um, a kind of hybrid of, of, of graphic design and painting. So at the moment... I'm, um, I suppose a list of what I'm actually doing at the moment um, would, would explain that. Um, I've just designed um, the carpets which go in the new law courts in London, which was opened a couple of weeks ago, which is a piece of graphic design. I'm doing five um, book covers for Penguin, and they're going back over their 50 decades, so I'm doing five books from the 50s, your Lucky Jim and books like that. Um, I'm doing a, a, a book jacket of, 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 for Ian Dury, and I've just done the titles for a film about Ian Dury called um, Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll. So I've you, you taught Ian Dury, didn't you? I did, yeah. Mm. But the, I've done, you've done the and graphics. And I've done other, for the, other for graphics this, for this film. Yeah. Um, and at the same time as all this, um, I'm about to, to start um, a, a, a painting which will go into St Paul's Cathedral, um, where the the knights just have a, a new chapel there. So I'm doing a four foot square painting of um, St. Martin, who was, the, he, he was a, a Roman centurion who, who um, rode out of a city on a big white horse and saw a beggar and cut his cloak in half and gave half, half the cloak to the beggar uh, who happened to be Jesus. So, so the cast is you know, a city, a white horse, a red cloak and two men. So that'll be exciting to do that. So, so, the, so I keep a kind of um, a balance. And I, I but, but you do believe in a strong delineation between the two? Sorry? You do believe in a strong delineation between the two? Um, uh, well, I, I suppose I do it to myself. I mean, when, when I'm painting, I'm a painter. When, mm. when I'm um, 
when I'm doing the graphic design, I'm a graphic designer, but as I say, an, an unformed one, a misinformed one. So it means I can, um, I feel I can do things in, in graphic design which needn't be pure. You know, I mean, I know something about typography, but I don't know everything about typography. Mm. So, I, so I use typography, but in a, in a rogue way somehow, you know, which is what I was trying to explain earlier. Mm. I, I just wonder if, you know, in 10,000 years' time, when they excavate the long forgotten city of London and the environs around it, and on the one hand, they come across a magnificent carpet, and on the other hand, they come across a wonderful painting in the ruins of a cathedral. Will there be a distinction between the two? They'll say, what the hell was going on? <laughs> what was he doing? <laughs> it's not my problem, it's the art historian's problem. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, so, absolutely. So, someone else can sort it out. Uh, an art historian. An art historian applauds, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, album covers. Um, do you curse uh, the technology which delivered us into the horrible hands first of the CD and, uh, and now of the, um, um, of the music download that what was for a brief but flourishing moment a wonderfully influential new design form sort of flared out and has maybe disappeared or at least doesn't have the same impact that it has. Well, things come and go, don't they? And they mm. Things have a lifetime, you know, I mean, carving onto marble or, or, or whatever, you, um, everything has a lifetime. And I think the CD, in a way, um, had a run. And as it happens, I mean, all the covers I've done have also been, um, I meant LP has a run. All the covers I've done have also, have also come out in LPs, so even the CDs, Mm. Um, and in a way, I, I tried to use it. You know, so, so the cover for Paul Weller um, for um, Stanley Road, you, I, I designed a CD which, which was of him um, as a young man kneeling, holding a picture of himself as a grown man. Um, and, and that um, also came out as, as a, an LP. And the idea was that if you bought the LP, it, it had a, a, a kind of border of design around it of targets and hearts and things. If you bought the CD, it was the same packaging, but there was a rebate and the CD fitted back into this little flat box, as it were. Mm. So, so um, and I think, I mean, I suppose in a way the sad thing now is that the, the, the CD is, is being um, replaced because it's only just coming into its own. I think for a long time, uh, it, it wasn't up to me, it was up to young designers, I think, to, you know, to, to, to work it out and say, look, this isn't 12 inches square, it's four inches square. Um, we have to think differently. And I think it was just beginning to happen, you know, with people like the Pet Shop Boys were bringing out, um, you because know, that box is awful, isn't it, that plastic? The, the, well, the plastic box. thing is terrible, yeah. so the first thing was to get rid of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was beginning to happen. Mm. People were bringing out rubber boxes or, or just putting them into, into a simple cardboard mm. um, um, sleeve. Um, but I don't think either of those things will go away completely. I think. Uh, um, th there'll be a kind of um, a step back and, and, and LPs will become a kind of retro thing mm. where uh, I, what I personally think is, sure. is as they disappear now, they'll come straight back in a different form and be as strong as ever and people will start to collect them as something else, you know, as, a, you know, as, as a kind of um, an object that's gone in a way. Mm. And of course, from the, going back to the 60s point of view, and indeed Sergeant Pepper's, the problem with the CD is you couldn't roll a spliff properly on it as well. You, were, you couldn't roll a spliff on it properly, <laughs> um, but uh, moving swiftly on. Um, I wouldn't I, know. I, it, well, well in a, in a, in a related, uh, on a related subject, I mean, like, I am going to ask you about, about Sergeant Pepper's because in a way, it, as well as being one of the iconic, iconic album covers of all time, it's also so recognisably a piece of your work, it seems to me. Is that fair? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. I mean, my only problem with it is, as you know, that I was paid very little for doing it. And um, in, in a way, I've resolved that. I mean, I, um, the situation was that Robert Fraser actually, a, a cover was, was made already. Uh, you probably know all this, but it had been designed by a Dutch design group called The Fool, Simon and Marijke. And they designed a kind of psychedelic cover and Robert Fraser, who was the gallery I was with and who was, who was friendly with the Beatles, saw that cover and said in 50 years' time it'll just be another psychedelic cover, you know, like a Jimi Hendrix cover or something. 
and, and why don't you, he said to the Beatles, use your, one of my artists and get, get a kind of, um, in italics, a fine artist, get a, get a painter to do it. Um, and so that's how it came about. And then there are all kinds of stories of how, how we did it. But um, the, the point was that um, Robert, who, was, who at that point was, was out of his mind the whole time, you know, um, stoned the whole time, signed a contract, which he clearly didn't read, which, which, um, and then subcontracted it to me, and he signed away any royalties, any royalties I might have had, but also I have no copyright on it. So for years I couldn't do anything with it, and people would say, you know, may, we, you know, may we use the idea? And I always would refer them to, to Apple, and it's only in the last couple of years I've made a print of it. But any, this is all in a way beside the point, because I have... I have it must be deeply annoying. It was, it was very annoying, but, but I'd reached a point, I'd, I'd covered it, you know, and yeah. I'd, um, I'd, I eventually saw a QC, and he said, look, we could, we could, we could maybe go back, um, but can, if, if we do and you lose, can you lose a quarter of a million pounds? And I clearly couldn't at that point. So, so at that point, I did write it off. I mean, emotionally, I, I don't get upset by it anymore, mm. but I'm constantly reminded of it, you know, that everywhere, <laughs> everywhere I go. <laughs> I mean, I haven't noticed them yet today, but you'll see in the distance someone with a 12-inch square plastic and bag, and they'll slowly come closer. <laughs> almost, they'll almost <laughs> kind of hide behind other people, yeah. and then suddenly they're in front of you, and they say, um, would you mind signing this? You're as though it's the first one I've ever signed. Yeah. And suddenly... Ten other people appear <laughs> and form a queue, and, and I sign them. Yeah, and, and so I'm constantly reminded of it. So, okay. if, if any of you have them here today, I will sign it. I'm, and I'm, I'm not being nasty about it. It's very gracious of you to sign it, but uh, in, in itself, I would have thought. That. Um, I mean, you went out, you, you, you changed tack quite a bit. Uh, could you talk a little bit about ruralism? Yeah. Which is where the, the direction you went in. At, at the end of the 60s or when the 60s were over? Well, that, that was really part of a general exodus. You, I, I, think, uh, I think the 60s are, are, are really defined within the 60s. My whole life has been defined by decades. The 60s started you know, with all the things we've talked about. And in 69, there was a general kind of exodus from London. I think people, I, I suppose they almost looked at the calendar and thought, well, the 60s are over. Um, will we'll change. And, and I went to the West Country, Dick Smith did, Howard Hodgkin, Joe Tilson. So there was a general kind of feeling of moving on to something else. Mm. And in some cases that became a, a kind of self-sufficiency. You know, that, that um, Joe, for instance, um, used to, at one point, made all his own wine and beer and at one point actually grew the wheat to make his own bread. I mean, I didn't go that far. But there was a general kind of mood and I think the ruralist came out of that. And a ruralist is someone who moves, um, the, the dictionary definition, someone who moves from the city to the country. So it's city, a city person living in the country. Um, and it came about really by chance that uh, um, I was organising an exhibition um, in Bath of West Country artists and met a group of them um, and we were having dinner one night and this, almost playing this kind of game of if you were a pre-Raphaelite, which one would you be? And I, I said, well, I'd be John Everett Millay. And somebody else said, well, I'd be Holman Hunt. And, and in a way, it came out of that. And we decided to form um, a, a, a pre almost a protective group. You know, the, 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 the kind of painting we were doing at that point was, was highly unfashionable and, and, and very open to criticism. And we almost were a kind of protection for each other. And did that work? Um, it, it became quite political, you know, the, the, almost in, in self-defence. You know, one, one, ha one had to kind of perhaps be um, stronger about it than we needed to be. It, it's quite complicated, and it, it, it ended when, I, um, when, when um, my first wife and I separated and I came back to London, at the end, uh, uh, oddly enough, at the end of the 70s. So that decade was living in the country and the ruralists. Um, and it ended at that point, you know, so, um, um, and by definition, I wasn't a ruralist anymore. You say you became unfashionable, and, uh, I mean, that's something that can happen to anybody in, yep. in, in any walk of life, but was there perhaps a, implicitly more of a danger of that because of the nature of 
the, you know, the kind of art you were doing in the 60s and the way it was tied in with popular culture, which in itself tends to be pretty transient and very fast cycles in its fashionability. Was, did it in some way relate to that, do you think? Maybe. It, it all makes sense now. I mean, looking back, it, uh, you, th th there's a pattern. You, 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 I'm coming, I'm not being morbid about it, but I'm coming to, towards the end of my career. You know, I mean, I've, I've done a, a body of work and looking back, um, Ruralism takes its place with everything else, and in, in a way, your pop art was then, but it never quite went away. And I'm doing things now that relate back, and there's a, a natural kind of toing and froing that you can look back on and think that's what happened. You know? mm. And I suppose what kicks into play as well, then, as, as new generations come along, is a sort of nostalgia. Uh, I saw the, the the album cover you did for Oasis, who have kind of based most most of their career actually on remembering the era. The couple of albums around Sgt. Pepper, yeah, sure, you know, yeah. before and after uh, Sgt. Pepper's, and 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 that and that plays with with that with that Beatles-esque '60s iconography as well, well doesn't well, the, it? The yeah. story of that is that they they had a very specific idea they wanted. They they they'd found a photograph of of a shop on the King's Road called Granny Takes a Trip, which had a a, a painting of a kind of Bieber-like girl on 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 on, on it, um, and and I did some work working on that where um, I, I would have, I did it on the computer, but I would have stood the band in front of it and then I would have added things to the actual shop, you know, which would have been kind of graffiti and, and, and posters stuck to it that would have given the other information. Anyway, I, um, at, at a certain point, they discovered that um, Nigel Weymouth, who had run Granny Takes a Trip, was about to bring his own album out and, and using that exact image. So suddenly we had to scrap all that. So Noel Gallagher came over to the studio, and really we, we had no idea what we'd do at that point. But as we walked around, he, he liked certain things. I mean, he, he liked an old um, dartboard. I've got a big double fairground dartboard, and I made a piece called Locker in, in 1959 that was a, a, you know, a, a blue locker with objects stuck to it. So really we just kind of brought a lot of stuff in and, and set it up. But the link in a way was that that I, I, I almost played a kind of game of, of inventing iconography. I mean, you, you know all the Sergeant Pepper stories about yeah. you, um, when the story of when Paul was supposed to have died, and there was all kinds of imagery which mm. was never put in there, but people made it up. Well, I, I, I'd left a set of clues that people could make up mythologies from. And for instance, the, in the locker, there are the seven dwarves but two of them are standing behind the other five. And I hoped what would happen, people would start to say, well, why are those two not, why, why are they not in a row? And I knew no one would be interested, but there's a series of kind of, 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 um, of mock, um, mock mythologies. And the, the, only, the only genuine one is that the, the little Snow White figure is the same Snow White figure that was in, in the flowers on, on Sergeant Pepper. So that's an actual myth. Mm. But the rest is all invented mythology. Sounds like a lot of fun. It was fun, yeah. I always have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're not being morbid. Um, you're still clearly a very young man. Uh, there are plenty of life ahead of you. you. You have lots of projects. We were just talking before we came in. You're, what are you working on right now? Um, well, what I was working on last week was the, the, the Penguin covers, um, a, an advertisement for Hackett, the clothes company, I'm, I'm planning the St. Paul's picture. I'm beginning to think about that and, and draw it in my mind and think about it. Um, I'm, the Ian Dury film is just, we just completed, so it's about to be shown for the first time. Um, so a, a lot of things, like the, the other book jackets. Um, I'm, 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 I'm continuing to, to illustrate Under Milk Wood, which I've been doing for 10 years and it's become a very enormous kind of project. So there's a lot, a lot to do. And I had a show open two weeks ago in Paris of, of new collages, about 80 new collages. So um, a lot's going on. So an artist never retires? Well, I, I invented my, you're probably mm. referring to my kind of mock retirement, my, no, my, my conceptual retirement. <laughs> but when when I, I, I was two years at the National Gallery as artist in residence, and when I left there, I was 65. The exhibition was called Now We Are 64, and, and the we referred to myself, and the chimpanzee from the Tarzan movies, who had, <laughs> who had been in the news that week because he was 64. Mm. So, 
So the billing, as you went in, it had his biography and my biography. <laughs> and I got, I got, it's a long, there's a lot of stories around this which I won't even go to. But I got two paintings from him that I exhibited um, with my painting to the fury of Brian Sewell, as you can imagine. You know, you know, and he, 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 he was working on this, Cheetah was working on the show um, of, his, of his own work. And when it, when it was shown, it said, um, as, as exhibited in the National Gallery of London, um, you know, on, on his poster. You know, so. Fantastic. Anyway, Cheetah, th that's all digressing. Uh, uh, mind so, you, Cheetah wrote a terrific autobiography last year, so he's still going. Yet, yeah, but, very good. And then, I mean, the, w w in this first article, the, the great image of him was um, his, his owner, Dan Westfall, um, it, what would happen at the end of Cheetah's day of painting, he, he would... Dan would uh, put him on the back of his scooter and there's a picture of Cheetah wearing a cowboy hat with a glass of whiskey in one hand and a cigar in the other hand riding around Palm Springs on the back of Dan Westfall's scooter. I mean, what a, what a way to go. Um, but, um, but, but, the, but the retirement um, was, was that I was 65 that year and that's the age of retirement normally, isn't it? And, and I, I invented this concept that I would, I would retire from the anxieties and the, the greed and the, the, the bad side of the art world. Um, so I, w I wouldn't be jealous anymore. I wouldn't be avaricious. I wouldn't, you know, and in a curious way it's happened. But I would keep working, but I would step back from the business of the art world. Um, and, and then more recently, um, um, well, I'm 77 now, so two years ago when I was 75, I announced that I was into my late period. Yeah, so rather than have um, art history defined um, when I was in my late period, I mean, I, 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 would, I, I would say, you know, mm. I mean, for instance, if um, Aubrey Beardsley um, had known that at the age of 23 he was in his late period, <laughs> he, he, he would have been upset, I think. <laughs> so, so, um, so let's hope it goes on for a long time, but I'm, I'm on that kind of final run. Um, I'm, I think we're a little pressed for time. I mean, I would be interested to see if, uh, try and get a couple of questions from the audience. Um, if, uh, I gather this event is being run at military uh, efficiency uh, according to a timetable, so I don't want to go over that, but I think we have time for a couple of brief questions, if that's okay. Um, I will, com I am completely blinded by these lights, so I'll be guided by, we do have, I think, a roving mic, yeah. and if somebody could just, Aha, that's a lot better, or some, some do better anyway. Hello. And people could just, hello there, yeah. <laughs> people could just put, put up their hands and we'll, we'll, we will get a mic to you if you do have any questions. If you don't, of course, that's also fine. Right. Uh, anybody there at all? Yes, well. yes, the mic is on its way. How are you? Uh, you, you touched on uh, yourself as a tutor with the injury. And uh, I'm just interested to know, how, how do you feel your role as uh, an academic or teacher and as a practitioner in that tenuous area between art and design, uh, how they related to each other and how they fed into each other? I, I, I didn't teach for that long. I, I, um, I, I was given the job back at Gravesend School of Art where I was a student. I was given half a day a week out, out of sympathy, I think. So, so that was the start of my teaching career. Um, and then I, I did, in the, from I think from 60 through to 64, I taught, and on Mondays I taught at St. Martin's teaching a, a kind of um, a, a observational drawing. On Tuesday I taught at Harrow teaching illustration. And on Wednesday, I taught at Walthamstow, teaching the painters there. Um, and um, I mean, the reference to Ian Dury, I taught Ian at Walthamstow, and then he got into the Royal College in 64, in 63, and I got a job at the Royal College in 64. So I kind of taught him right through his career. And I think, I think what I was able to do was being, just to, to enable people in, in a way, you know, that, that I could open doors and I could, I could encourage them so I, I probably didn't teach that much, but I, I could make things possible. I mean, in Ian's case, um, we, we had a conversation about what, what he was interested in, and I said, well, paint that, you know, and it was as simple as that. So I could open doors. I mean, on the illustration, 
teaching. I suppose I was, I was teaching all kinds of things which were illicit at that point, like tracing and copying photographs and things which you didn't do at that point. So, so I suppose I've been quite subversive as well. Anybody else? I'm not sure if your eyesight is any better than I mine, think, but mine is... I think our time's probably run out anyway. I think it probably has. Yeah. Somebody's flashing a light. Which we, can, we can take one more. We'll take one more if there's, if there's, if there's anybody there, or if not. Yeah. Do you have a favourite piece of work that you've made? And if so, what is it? A favourite piece of work? It, it changes all the time, I think. Um, you, I, I, I suppose I have to um, ad admit that Sergeant Pepper was the most iconic. You know, it's probably the most famous piece of work I've made. Um, there's, there's a painting called Self Portrait with Badges, which I, um, which I think, I, I think every so often you paint a picture where you surpass yourself, whatever the circumstances are. You, you, you manage to paint something you're, you're relatively pleased with. Um, some of the, you know, some of the pop art imagery I, I, looking back, I, I, I like, um, but it changes constantly. I suppose if I had to choose one, it probably would be self-portrait with badges, yeah. Which is very well known, very influential in itself. I'm, I'm surprised that you'd mentioned Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Arts Club Band after. I mean, I well, got the impression no, um, you're, you're, I mean, you're sick of it. But. In most cases, it's, it's, what I'm no, it's, it's, the, it's the one mm. thing I'm known for, which, which is both good and bad. I mean, it's wonderful. It, it's bad because um, you know, I've done so much other things. And some people only think I di think I only did that. Sure. But but it's good that it's still talked about and it's still held up as a, a, as a kind of um, as an icon of of, um, of CD design of LP design. Yeah. On that note, I hope there aren't 120 people outside the door with copies of of, of, of it for you to sign. I, uh, I can't see any. No. <laughs> I can't see the carrier bags. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sir Peter Blake for joining us for this conversation. It's been a real pleasure for me, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Sir Peter, thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you.